Something so good happened last week. Yes, there was a miracle, but this is the other good thing. I got the silver award from YouTube and how I received it was via UPS. There was a big flump on my front porch and I walked out there and there was a UPS guy walking away and I looked down and I saw it was from YouTube and I said, ah! and he turned around like there was a problem and I said, look, look what I got. And he said, is that a YouTube award? And I said, yes. And he said, I've never seen one before. And he came and took a look at it. <laughs> I was so proud. So I've been saving this to do an unboxing video with you. This is the box. And um, you kind of notice that the tape is all frayed right here. And so is the cardboard because I really couldn't wait. I was so excited to look at it and I had to show it to my family and then I had to show it to the people who came over and finally I'm sitting down to tape it. But pretend this is the first time I've opened it. <gasps> it's my YouTube award unboxing video. I'm Anna Runkle, also known as the Crappy Childhood Fairy. And on at the end of January, I crossed over the 100,000 subscriber line, which is something that makes me so proud, really the most meaningful milestone in my career and I'll show you what it is. There's the box. Here's this um, kind of cardboard tray. Like I said, it's all torn up because I've taken it out so many times. There's a little card here from the person who inspected it saying if I have questions I can call. There's a letter from the CEO of YouTube and she says, do you remember your first subscriber, your 100th? your thousandth subscriber. And to be honest, I remember those numbers. They were amazing, but you don't really know who they are. <laughs> exactly. We're thrilled to see the development of your community and are proud to honor your impressive milestone of reaching 100,000 subscribers with the Silver Creator Award. Congratulations. We know that you have many more stories to share with your community, and we know that your fans can't wait for you to engage and amaze them even more with your commitment and creativity. So keep creating, keep building. We can't wait to see what you'll do next, and we're here to support you along the way. And who knows, when you reach your millionth subscriber, we may just write to you and ask, do you remember your 100,000th subscriber? And then yours sincerely from Susan, the CEO. <laughs> Pretty cool. All right. Then there's a card here where you can order for your team. And then here is the plaque itself. And finally, I get to take it out of the plastic, which I actually have not done. Oh, wow. I'm trying to get it so that the light doesn't blind you with that. See that it actually says crappy childhood fairy. <laughs> that just, I get a kick out of that. So I wanna tell you a little bit about my intense relationship with YouTube ever since it came out in 2006. I was a creative kid and I in the past had made films, had done comedy, I wrote a book, I did all this creative stuff. I started making films when I was six with my brother and one of the limitations of making films back then, well there were two big ones, it's really expensive to make film and also it's really hard to find a place where you can share it with other people. Like what are you going to do, invite them to your house? How many people do you actually know who could come see your film? So until there was a way to share video online, film was so inherently limited to people who, unless they had money or connections or something to get into film festivals or theaters, you know, that was like pie in the sky for me back then. So YouTube came out and I was jealous. If there had been YouTube when I was a kid, I would have been all over that. And so when it first came out, I, I sort of had this idea that I was too old <laughs> to do it. I was too old and my kids were making like Lego Star Wars stop motion videos and, and um, scare videos and things. And I got so interested in what they were doing. And right about that time, I ended up starting a video production company. It was kind of a departure from what I had been doing before. And the work that I had been doing before wasn't really happening right then. And I had to come up with a way to make money at the time. I was like a single mom of my two kids and, and and so I had had this experience in college making videos and I got this idea that I would reach out to all my professional contacts and offer to make videos and convince them that you could put videos online. And at the time that was kind of a crazy idea. This was 2007, 2008. And people would say, oh, there isn't bandwidth and why would anybody want to see that in any way we have a website? 
And so the very first video I made was to convince people that you should put videos online. So I like to think, you know, I was, I was visionary <laughs> about what you could do with video. But I still had never, it had still never occurred to me that I would make video of my own content that, and things that I had to say. For my clients, I was making dramatic videos. I was making a lot of marketing videos. And over the, how many years? I don't know, 12 years or so that I was running the video production company, I still own it. I don't work there very often, but I still own it. And I've, I've calculated, I probably conducted 2,000 interviews and then directed people while they were being interviewed on camera and did this with a crew, with my team. And the interviews taught me so much about how to be on camera. And when you're sitting there interviewing somebody and they're struggling or they're kind of shut down or they're having trouble putting their words together, I had that much time to watch people and think about like, how would you do this? How, how could you do it? And from time to time, somebody wouldn't show up for an acting part in one of the videos we were making. And I would step in and I'd play the doctor in the video or I'd be the spokesperson. And this was all on a teleprompter. And my clients were always like, whoa, you should be on camera. And I used to have in the back of my mind, yeah, maybe I should. I wanted to tell you the story of the founding of Crappy Childhood Fairy, how it got started, how it ended up being a thing, a blog, but then a, a video, a YouTube channel, and then how the YouTube channel ended up going so well, what I know so far. Most of you have heard the story about how I had CPTSD and for years I had no idea what it was and I had no treatment, basically like all of you. And I had the good fortune somebody taught me some techniques, which I teach everybody who, will, who wants help. I call it the daily practice. It's a writing and meditation technique that helps calm the symptoms of CPTSD. And I probably taught, oh gosh, 300 or 400 people how to do it face-to-face, one-on-one. So what happened was the book, The Body Keeps the Score, came out by Bessel van der Kolk. And that rocked my world because it was clinical validation of something that I had been experiencing anyway. And it went into great detail about what he had observed in his work. And it was so enlightening to me. And like many people who have CPTSD, it clarified, validated, and propelled us forward into understanding like this is what it is. It has a name. It's a thing. It affects your brain. It causes something called dysregulation. Absolutely changed changed my life. And I remember telling a group of friends, I read this book, I learned about something called complex PTSD. I think I have it. I think you might have it. Next thing you know, there were 20 people in my living room for a book study of this book. Everybody wanted to talk about it. And the whole book study ended up being kind of fraught. Some people were getting triggered. They were upset. And I just thought, oh, this thing's too much of a hassle. And when I stopped it, so many people kept saying, would you bring it back? And they had told friends and other friends wanted to do it. So I said, I tell you what, I'll, I'll write a blog about it. So I wrote a blog about what I had learned there and kind of reflecting on my own experience. Um, I think it was called, it was called Your Healing Year for a minute. That was boring me to death. I just couldn't bring myself to write anything. Then I called it The Feral Girl's Guide. And um, I, I, fa I don't know, people were reacting badly to the idea that I was calling them feral, which is the way that I felt about it. And then finally the name came to me, Crappy Childhood Fairy. <laughs> and I remember walking out into the living room and my kids were out there and I said, you guys, I have an idea for, the, for my blog. And um, I'm thinking Crappy Childhood Fairy. And they were like, no, mom, that is really stupid. <laughs> Somebody your age shouldn't do anything called that. <laughs> and, anyway, they, they, they've come around on that. Everybody has. But I was like, you know, I, I really couldn't think of anything that captured what I was trying to do better and didn't have that ponderous seriousness of like, your healing year, PTSD central, or I don't know, something heavy. I, I wanted something that could have cartoons, that could have lightness. And so my blog started out with black and white cartoons and then color cartoons and these articles. And I got to say the articles, they were very dull at first. They were very clinical. I had worked in public health for a long time and I had a lot of, um, I felt very limited by my fear that I had to somehow get my work approved by higher ups in the public health world. Well, pretty soon it was clear the public health world was either very challenged by what I was saying or had never even heard of me. And I could just completely stop worrying about that. I do worry very much about being 
accurate about using language that makes it clear that I'm not a therapist or a clinician and that I'm teaching from my own experience. So the blog was really like spectacularly not very successful. There were a few people who followed it and looked at it. I sent it to all my friends, you know, nine of them subscribed. And finally, I don't know, a couple of strangers subscribed. But there, I wanted to teach the writing technique that I had been using. And I made my first video about, about this writing technique and put it out there. And I, I distinctly remember working really hard on that, sharing it with everyone, writing some articles, and like the video had 167 views. And I was like, wow, 167 people viewed. And that is a lot. You know, if you had 167 people in your house, saying, I cared enough to watch your video. That, I mean, that's amazing. 10 people doing it is amazing. And so the, the growth on YouTube is not lost on me about how just incredibly wonderful and meaningful it is that so many people have found this useful, what I was teaching. So I wasn't that good of a teacher at first. I was making videos and my wall back here, it was just, I painted it like dark gray and I had these little pieces of cutout paper on it. I was trying to just give it some depth and color or something. And at first I was trying to ad lib videos and talk about it. And I was shocked to find out that I just like, as much as I had directed 2000 people in their interviews, when I did it, I was like floppy and soft and hesitant. And I didn't know where I was going with it. And it didn't make for good video. So <laughs> I went to Toastmasters and I started practicing public speaking. And now that, you know, I've been locked down for a year, I'm not super boned up on that, but I lost the habit of saying, um, um, um. And I learned to breathe a lot better. I took singing lessons. I can't wait to start those again. <laughs> when you can breathe well, you can speak well. And then I also started writing scripts for myself. And some of my videos that are very scientific or complicated, they're written and I read them off a teleprompter. More recently, I've gotten off the teleprompter because now I've gotten to know my subject well enough that I feel free enough to speak extemporaneously. There was a long period of time where I wasn't really paying attention to YouTube. I was building up a blog and occasionally putting videos over there to support stuff that I was writing about on the blog. And I never even looked at it except to upload a video. And I didn't know the first thing. I remember some viewers saying, you know, Anna, it would be better when you put links in the description section to put HTTPS colon slash slash so that it's a live link and we can click on it. And I, I was like, wow, right. I, did, I never thought of that. That was really helpful. So I, didn't, I wasn't really paying attention to YouTube. I was thinking of it as just a place to like upload videos and then stream them into my blog, my funky little blog. But one day when I went over to upload a video, and this was only like a little over two years ago, it was January, 2019, I looked over there and I was having this surge of activity, like a spike. This happens sometimes on YouTube. I had a whole bunch of subscribers. I had no idea. People who, way more subscribers on YouTube than I had on the blog and I had no idea who they were or how they found it. So I, I took an interest and I started to intentionally make videos for YouTube. And then I would put a written version of that over on the blog and, I would, uh, and draw a cartoon. And to this day we do that, although I don't do the cartoons anymore. Harry Fricker does, he does the cartoons. So that became the new mode. And the next thing I did was I made a course. I made the course Healing Childhood PTSD. It came out in June, 2018, not even three years ago. And when it came out, I had enough subscribers on my blog that some people signed up. <laughs> I think I was getting about five signups a month for a while and I was so proud. And it turned out that when I made a video and stuck it on YouTube, a couple of people were seeing the content on YouTube. I think I put a couple of videos from the course up there too, sort of said, hey, I'm doing this thing, you know, for the 60 people or whatever who were ever gonna watch my videos over there. And all of a sudden, some signups came from that. People said they found me on YouTube. And I was absolutely floored. And I started, I started to imagine how this could all go together. Now, I didn't just jump into this cold. The person who taught me how you make a business that includes stuff like blog, webinar, videos, courses, coaching, that kind of thing, was Brendan Burchard. He's fantastic. He pioneered the, the business model for this of, how you, how you can um, become an expert based on your own experience and monetize it, actually sell products for it, support people and actually, you know, really, really help people, but using digital media for it. 
and he teaches about the emails that you need and the platforms that you need. So I was gradually building this up. So once I had that course out, I started to really need team. And so early on, Steven Higginbotham, my web guy, Ramon Wickham, who's the back-end marketing guy who answers many of your emails, he came on board. I made a second course, the dating course, POW, that one was really powerful. And then in the summer of 2019, Dysregulation Bootcamp. So now we started to have something. Um, I had the free daily practice course, the isolation course, and all of this became enough to create a membership program. And that started in 2019 in the fall and immediately people started signing up for it. And this started turning into like a business. It started being so much more than a blog with some YouTube streaming, but it became what I do. And so I had this very tough year where I was running both businesses with team members working in both companies. And I'll tell you one of the things that happened that really helped Crappy Childhood Fairy grow is COVID. <laughs> COVID came, my, my regular video production company, the uh, volume of work shrunk way down and it wasn't me who really had to be on shoots anymore. And I was able to start really putting my time into this channel and making this go. But right before COVID, I went to a, um, I, I was at a mastermind meeting in Puerto Rico and I met Evan Carmichael. And I don't know if you've ever seen him. He is, he's a guy on YouTube. He's got this channel. He's got like 3 million subscribers. He's doing so well. And he's this intensely positive person. And I saw him speak for about an hour. And when he was speaking, he said, you know, if anybody wants to just ask me some questions, please do. So I ran out into the hallway and I was just like, Evan, Evan, this was so valuable for me to talk to somebody because I don't know, you know, you, <laughs> YouTube, it's, there's actually a science to it, but it, I was not finding it easy to learn what it was. And I asked him a bunch of questions out in the hallway and he gave me like 10 pieces of solid gold advice about how to do my thumbnails, how to title my videos, how long should they be? How should they begin? And I started to follow his advice as soon as I got home at the end of January. And I just want to show you this like traffic spike. I started using his advice and it just went like, boom, a whole bunch of people started finding me. And that was um, very much around a video that I created after meeting him called Why I Quit Therapy. It was a video I'd been thinking about for a long time. Also 12, 12 things I wish my doctor understood about trauma. These were two that I, I had had like in my heart for years, but I was terrified to put it out there. I felt like I was gonna be burning bridges with everybody in the clinical world if I would go ahead and say, that it had not worked for me and that I needed it to be better and that I wanted it to be better for other people. Well, that is really what put Crappy Childhood Fairy on the map and a whole bunch of traffic came. Then COVID came like a week later and I got kind of tripped up. I was having a hard time like finding my sea legs with the new equipment and the new lifestyle like, like everybody else. I was kind of swimming in it but I started making videos and then I got really slow. I, I just, you know, I think I got kind of depressed about the lockdown and I, I wasn't making a lot of videos and you'll see my numbers just kind of like, they went down and they went down and they went down. And then, um, and I guess it was September in 2020. I was just like, you know what? I really want to get back to YouTube. I love making YouTube videos. It's like the great joy of my life. And then I signed up for Evan Carmichael's YouTube boot camp. And I just want to say to anybody out there, if you're thinking about, um, going for it on YouTube and you want to learn how to reach your audience and make money and all that good stuff on YouTube and be successful on YouTube. This is such a good class and it's such good value for money. I'm going to put a link to it down below so you can take that. Um, so you can sign up for that. So the YouTube bootcamp is kind of a deep online course. The, he also has this program called Movement Makers and one called Brandlytics. I'm in all of it. I take everything that he does. I want to show you my numbers of what happened once I started doing that. I do feel like my videos were good, what I'm teaching is good, but doing it on YouTube is a specific science and connecting with the audience. There are certain things that I needed to learn and understand and I never would have learned them unless some, somebody who had already mastered it had taught me. So seriously, if you want to do YouTube, go take this class. The key thing he's taught me is how to open my videos. I used to open them with this. Hello, I'm Anna Runkle, also known as the Crappy Childhood Fairy. I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> Today I want to talk about something we all feel so sad about and I would just, there would be this huge lead in. But if you can 
if you can just sort of front load your message right there and speak to that and work with that, I mean, just doing that made such a difference. The viewership just started to go up and up and up. So with YouTube, if your videos are good, people will watch them, but it can take time for the YouTube algorithm to kind of pick up and support you and where you're going with that. So learning the science of YouTube, it's still, I mean, it's still a, an ongoing project. I'm just figuring it out, but it took me about four years to get to 50,000. It took me, <laughs> I did about 50,000 subscribers. And then it took me another, I don't know, four months or something to get to a hundred thousand. And just in the time I crossed over a hundred thousand to the time this came in the mail, I got to 128,000 or something. But I'm upgrading because it's time, because things are going really well. And because YouTube growth has a way of being exponential. So for me, my next steps is to make more content. And that's why I've built up my team. You may have met Kara Alexander. She's answering some of the comments on YouTube and some of the emails that you send. Kamala, the moderator on Facebook, Joe, the Facebook ads guy, Jenny, who is a coach in my program. All of it's just growing and growing and growing. I want to thank this, my amazing team that has been forming around this company, all connected to the mission to change the world around the way we understand childhood trauma and how adults can heal from it. They are beautiful people. They work with great dedication and I look forward to the audience, you meeting some of them. So, I'm so excited. I'm working now on the release of multiple videos per week. I'm creating a new course all about connection. I'm working on a book proposal and I'm working on live events where we can all get together in cities in North America, Europe, and Australia as soon as possible. <laughs> so this is the most exciting gig in the world. And this award is something that we all got together. People say this when they get an award, but it's literally true when you get a, a YouTube award. I would not be here without you, the viewers. It's you watching and subscribing and sharing and supporting that make it possible. And P.S. When you give me those beautiful supportive comments, I cannot tell you enough how much it strengthens and empowers me. Making videos where you share your worst secrets about the terrible mistakes you've made and how you struggle is one of the most terrifying things in life. And there is a, there are occasionally people who give me hate. Um, I get these horrible emails. Sometimes I get comments, people put me down, they put you down in there. And so my team and I were in there, you know, we try to keep it clean and positive and the loving, supportive, validating comments that you send back to me on that comment section have been the absolute most wonderful thing in my professional life. I love you guys for this. So I'm very grateful to be here. I'm grateful to be working in this space. I'll see you when I hit a million. No, I'll see you way before that. I've got all kinds of videos that I'm making this week to release for you this week. So we'll see each other very soon, but thank you. And, and I, I love you deeply. Thank you. So if you're curious and you want to see one of my first videos, you can see this one right here. <laughs> It's not too bad, but it's shot by a professional videographer. So it looks a little better than some of the other videos I made at the beginning and I'll see you soon.